Straight ahead on Newswatch, President-elect Donald Trump fills more key posts, saves jobs that were headed to Mexico, and makes a big announcement on his family business. We've got all the latest on the Trump transition. Plus, when arsonists lit Israel's forest ablaze, their firefighters were stretched to the limit. We'll show you how these brave Americans rushed in to help. And the world's largest refugee camp is closing its doors. Why these refugees could be forced into a hotbed of Islamic violence. Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Donald Trump is racing towards the presidency with more cabinet picks, a Twitter firestorm, and a big win on jobs. An American company announcing it will no longer move to Mexico because of Trump. And the president elect tweeting today he is going to step down from his family business so he can focus on running the country. Our Heather Sells is on the story. A steady stream of visitors at Trump Towers this week provides a glimpse of the high-powered auditions for cabinet posts. Among the latest selections, Steven Mnuchin for Treasury Secretary. If confirmed by the Senate, Mnuchin will play a key role in shaping Trump's tax policy. Also, Wilbur Ross, a Wall Street financier for Commerce Secretary, and Elaine Chao for Secretary of Transportation. She served as Labor Secretary under the second President Bush, and she's the wife of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Trump also apparently offered a post to Robert Johnson, the founder of Black Entertainment Television. Johnson declined, saying that as entrepreneur, he didn't want to go into government bureaucracy, but also said he never thought Trump is a racist or anti-African American. For now, the biggest question is who will get the nod for Secretary of State. For days, Trump has been meeting with potential candidates. The Secretary of State's role is so important uh, to a president. Um, he needs to choose someone that he's very comfortable with. In addition to talking with Senator Bob Corker, Trump enjoyed an elegant dinner with Mitt Romney Tuesday night. Romney, despite calling Trump a phony and fraud during the campaign, now praising Trump for his victory in the election and his, quote, message of inclusion. And I have to tell you, I've been impressed by what I've seen in the transition effort. Also up for consideration for top diplomat, former CIA director David Petraeus. Trump created a bit of a firestorm on Twitter Tuesday, tweeting that nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, there must be consequences, perhaps loss of citizenship or year in jail. The Supreme Court has ruled that flag burning is constitutionally protected speech. Even so, many Americans agree with Trump, and Hillary Clinton also once tried to criminalize flag burning. One big win for Donald Trump, word of a deal on a campaign promise to keep jobs in America. This time, the Indiana air conditioning company Carrier. Believe me, if I were in office right now, Carrier would not be leaving Indiana, that I can tell you. Carrier had said it would lay off 1,400 workers and move to Mexico. Now it says it will keep nearly 1,000 jobs in the Hoosier state. It's a sign that Trump does intend to deliver quickly on his key campaign promises. Others that top his list, repealing Obamacare, fixing the immigration system, and strengthening the economy by cutting taxes and government regulations and bringing back jobs. Heather Sells, CBN News. ISIS is taking credit for an attack at Ohio State University, calling the attacker a soldier of the Islamic State. Donald Trump has tweeted in response saying, quote, ISIS is taking credit for the terrible stabbing attack at Ohio State University by a Somali refugee who should not have been in our country. The attacker had stated the U.S. should make peace with the Islamic State. Meanwhile, new reports the attacker's family received aid when they moved to the U.S. from Pakistan in 2014. An official from the Catholic Charities of Dallas said they gave his family shelter for 23 days. At least three people are dead in Alabama after a suspected tornado swept through the south last night. The three people who died were in a mobile home in northeastern Alabama in a community there called R Rosalie. There were a number of other injuries in the area. 16 to 20 buildings were destroyed. Other possible tornadoes were spotted across the south in Louisiana, Mississippi, and southern Tennessee. Raging wildfires and hurricane-force winds sent thousands of people fleeing for their lives in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. 
The fires have killed at least three people, sending more than a dozen others to the hospital with burns or smoke inhalation. The flames even threatening Dollywood, one of the area's largest tourist attractions. Officials say they have not seen a fire like this in years. There were times last night that we had wind gusts in excess of 87 miles an hour. That is hurricane force. That is nowhere to be when trying to fight a fire. The fire has destroyed at least 150 buildings, including entire churches. Rains have helped, but firefighters continue to brace themselves for a long fight ahead. The fires that ravaged Israel over the past week and a half were some of the worst in its history. While Israeli firefighters struggled to bring the flames under control, volunteer firefighters from the U.S. came to help during the crisis. Chris Mitchell is on that story. Four major fires swept throughout Israel. They were dangerous and difficult. They were bad. They were bad. Um, I've been on some wildland forest fires back in the States. Um, and they were just as bad as those. If you stand in front of it, it's going to burn right over you. If you try to run behind it, you can't catch up to it. With Israeli firefighters stretched to their limit on Thanksgiving Day, the call went out to U.S. firefighters to help. Amazing how all the, the American people stood behind Israel when we made the call. Probably within six hours, we had 39 people ready to go. When they arrived, they deployed throughout the country. Kind of hit the ground running. Um, as soon as we got here, we started going on calls right away. We, uh, we were able to help out with, uh, with some wildland fires, with some structure apartment fires. They came as part of a program called EVP, Emergency Volunteer Project. The goal of the project is to find the supporters of Israel that want to have their boots on the ground in Israel during crisis. Some came during big moments in their lives. Just before I came, I proposed to my girlfriend, so she is now my fiance, uh, Kathleen Humphreys, and uh, we've been doing wedding planning over the phone. For Israeli firefighters, it meant a lot to see so many come. It always makes a good feeling for us uh, to know that someone overseas care about us and thinking about us, prepared to come and help us. EVP volunteers also responded during the 2014 war with Hamas. It's a call firefighters answer when their brothers call. The best way to describe it is a brotherhood, uh, just like they are your family at home. This is my family at work, and uh, we keep in contact even when we're not in Israel. Many of the U.S. firemen are Christians and feel a call to stand with Israel. From the very beginning, I believe that, uh, that God commands us to stand by them, that we are to uh, be an advocate for Israel, we're to love them. Uh, my first trip here, I was given a prophetic word on Isaiah 40, come from my people. So it means everything to be able to be a part of their lives. It's a relationship that's expected to keep growing. And this is not going to stop. Uh, we love being here, they love having us here. It's truly an honor for me to come here and, and be with the guys here in the fire station. When we called our friends and we asked for their help, they came, and they came big time. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. We are learning more about some of the victims killed during Monday's deadly plane crash in Colombia. At least eight of them were members of a four-square church in Chapaco, Brazil. Glenn Burris, president of the ministry, announced their deaths on social media. On Facebook, he said, praying for all of Brazil, including the church in Chapaco, which, in, which is grieving immensely. At least 71 people were killed in the crash, including members of a Brazilian soccer club. Right now, investigators are still looking into what caused that crash. U.S. military veterans rallied outside Hampshire College in Amherst to raise the U.S. flag. It was a peaceful demonstration in response to the school's decision to take down the American flag. The flag controversy came after the election when angry students lashed out and set the flag on fire, an action these veterans call an insult to their sacrifice. Blood, sweat, and tears. Red, white, and blue. That's what it is. That's what this flag represents. This stands for all the veterans around the whole nation, everybody who fought for this flag. Too much blood has been shed uh, for our country, uh, for our freedom. School officials say they welcome peaceful discussions about the flag decision. Still to come, it has been a haven for refugees for 25 years, and now it's being shut down. So what is going to happen 
to thousands of women and children. The story's next. The world has been focused on the tidal wave of Arab refugees fleeing from the Middle East, but a similar tragedy in Africa has been basically ignored. A quarter of all the displaced people in the world are in Africa, and most of them live in a desert, in a desert refugee camp near the border of Kenya and Somalia. Now there's talk of closing this camp because of the threat of Islamic terrorism. George Thomas takes us into what has been called the largest refugee camp in the world. Getting clearance to visit the camp is not easy. After weeks of waiting, the Kenyan government gave CBN News the green light to land on a dirt airstrip in the middle of a parched and barren desert. 270 miles northeast of Kenya's capital city, Nairobi. You land there, you get in a car, and you start driving on a dusty road. There is no tarmac road, some mountains off in the distance. So you're stuck in the middle of a desert with nothing, purely nothing. Welcome to Dadaab, the world's largest refugee camp and they live in these camps, which are essentially uh, makeshift camps. Dome-like huts made from sticks and plastic sheeting dot the arid landscape. The climate is brutal, hot all year, with hardly a drop of rain. American aid worker Christopher Hoffman works in Dadaab. The food, the education, the hospitalization, the medical care, everything, the water, the toilets, everything is provided to you. Ibrahim was 20 years old when war disrupted life as he knew it. We were forced to flee from Somalia across the border into Kenya, and this is where we ended up. He hoped his stay here would be short-lived, a temporary place to wait out the violence. That never happened. Now, 25 years later, with 17 children, four grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren, Ibrahim, like so many others here, has witnessed multiple generations of families growing up in Dadaab. When the camp opened back in 1992, it was only supposed to hold about 90,000 people. Well, today, nearly 25 years later, more than 340,000 refugees call this place home. The majority of them Somalis fleeing civil war. They've lost their homes, they've lost their families and their communities. Teresa Angaro is with a UN agency that oversees operations in Dadaab. Her group, in partnership with other aid agencies, provides refugees with food, water, health care and education. For all the difficulties, Angaro says... This is the safest place that the refugees can go to and the place that they have now, uh, that they now call home. But that's about to change. The Kenyan government wants to close the camp and send Somali refugees like Mohammed who runs an ice-making factory in the camp, back to their war-torn homeland. As you can imagine, he is nervous about returning. Somalia is still in the middle of an Islamic insurgency that hasn't recovered from decades of conflict. Nothing has changed there. It is still a dangerous place. Authorities want to shut the place down because they believe it's a center for recruiting Islamic terrorists. Kenya government has expressed concerns about uh, security, mostly terrorism, uh, following various attacks in the country. So the repatriation is underway. During our visit, CBN News filmed chaotic scenes as authorities tried to fingerprint hundreds of refugees. This repatriation operation is causing us so much stress. I escaped here with my children. Some of them got lost on the way here. I don't know where they are. Just when I thought I was safe, now the government wants me to leave. The government claims some 24,000 refugees have voluntarily left the camp this year. Since the authorities announced back in May that they were planning to shut down the world's largest refugee camp, a new poll just out in Kenya shows that the majority of folks in the country support the government's decision. Once they close down the dab, uh, the insecurity cases will actually go down and Kenya will be a safer place. 
Still, human rights groups have accused Kenyan authorities of intimidating refugees into leaving against their will. The government says that the camps are a threat to national security. It might be a threat, but not everybody inside the camp is a threat, you know. Kenya hopes to cut the Dab's population in half by December. For now, Ibrahim tries to give his family hope, but knows the future ahead is uncertain. I'm thankful that Kenya has hosted us for the last 25 years, but it's going to be a big mistake to return us to a war zone. It's like throwing people into a fire. George Thomas, CBN News, Dadaab Refugee Camp. Up next, the best-selling author of True Crime and Don't Say a Word talks about the real-life moment of truth that transformed him from an atheist to a born-again Christian. Andrew Clavin is a best-selling, award-winning novelist and intellectual. You may have heard of his Homelander series or read his political commentaries in the Wall Street Journal. But you may not have heard about his religious journey from atheist to Christian. He was raised in Judaism by parents who didn't believe in God. But even as a young man, Andrew was on a quest for truth. And as he told Scott Ross, one day he found it. Because I was unhappy as a child, I became addicted to daydreams. I became a real daydreamer. And that really taught me how to write. Best-selling author Andrew Clavin grew up an angry young man. That's probably why the characters in his books are usually tough as nails and looking for answers. Here you are, a great neck Jew. Great neck is in Long Island, right? Long Island, yeah. A Jewish background. Were you religious? Well, we were raised in the religion. We were taught, sent to Hebrew school. We would celebrate uh, Passover and Yom Kippur and uh, such certain holidays. And we were bar mitzvahed. But the weird thing about it was my parents really didn't believe in God. Learning rules about a God who didn't exist made no sense to Andrew. So he threw himself into literature. Because I didn't get along with my father, I looked for male role models in fiction, and I found them in the tough guy fiction, in, in Hemingway and in Raymond Chandler, who had this great detective, Philip Marlowe, and I modeled myself after these guys. And the more I read, the more I found that Christianity was at the center of almost every great story that I love. We didn't have a New Testament in my house, right? We were Jews, so I went out and bought myself a New Testament. I started to read the Gospel according to Luke, purely as a piece of literature to find out what everybody was talking about. It convinced me that this figure of Jesus was at the center of Western culture, which I loved. I mean, it was the center of all the books that I loved. And that was not a religious idea. That was a literary idea. Mm. I didn't believe in it at all. You were in a search for truth, though. That was a thing in your gut, that you were out looking for truth. And this was all part of it, but you didn't recognize it then, right? I never. And that was one of the things that bothered me about the kind of Judaism I was raised in. And Judaism is a beautiful religion, but when you empty it of God, it has no meaning. And so that, that's become, been a very intense quest for me to make sure that the things I'm saying have at least attempt to have a relationship with reality. Andrew's search for truth made him realize that life didn't make sense without the existence of God but he still had no connection to him. And so I began in my mind to actually believe that there was a God, but I didn't quite know it yet. There was a little mm -hmm. bit of a lack of communication. And so what I did one day was I did an experiment. I was reading a book and this guy before he went to sleep said a prayer. And I thought, well, if he can say a prayer, I can say a prayer too. And it sort of seemed random at the moment. It seemed like a, praying to a God who wasn't there, but in my mind, I already had, had come to believe. And I said this three word prayer. I said, thank you, Lord. And I went to, and I fell asleep. And I woke up the next morning and truly everything had changed. I mean, everything, there was a new clarity to everything. My heart was filled with gratitude. I was experiencing a joy that had been there, but had been locked away. And suddenly knowing God opened me up to my own experience of life. And my prayers got longer and more elaborate and I would pray in my car and all this. And it transformed my life. And so one day I was driving in the Santa Barbara Hills and I said the same prayer to God again. I said, thank you, Lord. You've changed everything. Now what can I do for you? Like a voice, almost aloud, the, the words came into my mind, now you should be baptized. Baptized? Yes. And I said out loud as I was, I was driving, I said, you've got to be kidding me. 
because <laughs> no, I'm right. There's a there's what? a prayer yeah. for you. Yeah, there's, a, there, there's an answer I was not expecting. You know. Yeah. And it really did uh, create tremendous problems. A lot of uh, anxiety in my mind. My father was still alive, and even though he and I had never gotten along, we'd made a separate peace. He was a good grandfather, and you know, I didn't want to start that trouble. I knew that would really explode. Mm -hmm. So I really had to think to myself. Is this voice the voice of God, or is it some kind of delusion, some kind of crazy idea that's come into my mind? After five months of, of looking at it, I thought, nope, you know, this makes perfect sense. I know exactly why I came to this decision now. And so, yeah, I, I really understood that that voice was telling the truth to me. Do you consider yourself a completed Jew? What kind of Jew are you? I don't like to use words like completed Jew because I know some Jews find it, you know, like they're incomplete, incomplete and they right. find it an insult. Um, I, all I can say is for myself, I never knew my Jewish self until I found Christ and I found my Jewish self in Him. What's the pursuit now? What's the dream now? What's the vision now? I want to remember people like me who are, are living in a world where Atheism is the default setting, especially for people who consider themselves intellectuals. You know? mm. I want to speak into that world that we are all living in of broken people, of, of terrible violence, terrible hatred, terrible sorrow and grief, and, and say and speak of Jesus there, you know, because God is God of the real world. He's not God of a fantasy world where everything works out for the best. He is God of this world of, of trouble and pain. And so I don't want to forget the people who are like I was, sitting there thinking, I don't know how to live. Uh, at, you know, if I can just like maybe put s the next step in front of them, you know, you can't cross the river, you can't jump across the ocean, you gotta take a step at a time. And I think that if I can put a step in front of people, that would be great. I would consider myself a, a, a very successful guy. Superbook's Gizmo recently joined forces with other superheroes at Costa Rica's comic convention in San Jose. The CBN team participated in the Comic-Con weekend to help raise funds for a soup kitchen in Cartago. Gizmo greeted families who stopped by the Superbook station, and some 200 children and their parents watched a presentation of Superbook. The proceeds raised at the event went to the soup kitchen in Cartago. Well, that is going to do it for this edition of CBN News. Thank you so much. For more on our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about, you can always find it at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here. You can do it on Facebook, Twitter, as well as Instagram. Make this a wonderful Wednesday. We'll see you tomorrow.